So we talked about this game. We talked about uh, what does the force of the ball uh, depend on, right? How much does it hurt? What are the parameters that it depends on? So we mentioned that there were mass was important, right? How the, uh, the mass of the ball, how fast the ball is moving when it hits your leg or your body, what's the material of the ball what that is made of, and the shape of the ball is also important, right? So uh, talking about the connection between momentum, which we define as the product of the mass times the velocity, right? We say, what is the connection between the force and momentum, okay? So the connection is through this equation, which is basically Newton's second law, as we talked about last class, except that now you're putting it in terms of momentum, right? Instead of putting the derivative of the velocity with respect to time, which will be the acceleration, we take the derivative <laughs> out and apply it to the whole mv term, and that's your momentum. So the force turns out to be the derivative of the momentum. Force changes momentum. That's the basic idea, right? If you want to know by how much did the momentum change between final and initial, right? That would be p final minus p initial. Then uh, you can <coughs> integrate that equation over there. And the integral of the net force with respect to time gives you the change in momentum, right? So that's basically the area under the force versus time plot, right? So if you know how the force acting on an object depends on time, you can calculate the area under that between some ti and some t final, and that will tell you what's the change in momentum between ti and tf that the object is going to experience if that force is acting on it, okay? So suppose that a constant force is acting, uh, well, that a force is acting over some time, after some time, the object has been acting, the force has been acting on the object, so now the object has a final <coughs> momentum. It started with some initial velocity, initial uh, momentum and velocity. So the change in momentum that that object is going to experience between the initial and the final time will be the integral of the force, right? So this thing, we say that we call it the impulse, impulse of a force, right? Or area under the force versus time plot. And we give a letter J. So this is the impulse of the force F. Just reminding you what we talked about last class. Uh, this is a simple example I didn't give you in class, so let's go over it. Suppose that you have a hockey stick. So you have a hockey stick that is going to uh, change the velocity of a hockey puck. So let's say that the hockey puck has a mass of 0 0.1 kilograms, and that is moving with an initial velocity of 10 meters per second. Right? So the hockey stick is going to apply a force to the hockey puck. And let's say that the force is constant, 10 newtons over one second, yeah? So uh, what's the final velocity of the puck? Let's try to find that. Using the concepts of impulse, change in momentum that we just talked about. So the integral of the net force acting on that hockey puck is going to be equal to the change in momentum of the hockey puck, right? Now the only force that, uh, that uh, the net force acting on that hockey puck is going to be the force of the hockey stick, right? The normal and the weight are going to cancel each other, so those uh, don't contribute to the net force. The net force is simply going to be the force of the hockey stick. <coughs> Since the net force is constant, then we can just take the force out of the integral and simply say that the integral of the force with respect to time should be the product of the force and the amount of time that the force was acting uh, over. So if I know that quantity, if I know the impulse, of that hockey stick, then I know by how much the momentum of the hockey puck should have changed, right? The change in momentum of the hockey puck will be equal to the net force times delta t. The net force is 10 newtons, the time is one second, so your change in momentum should be equal to 10 kilogram meters per second. So that hockey stick is gonna change the momentum of the puck by 10 kilogram meters per second. This is not the final momentum of the hockey puck, right? This is the change in the momentum of the hockey puck. So delta P is 10, and delta P is defined as the final momentum minus the initial momentum, right? So that's the mass times the final velocity minus the mass times the initial velocity. We're looking for the final velocity, 
and we have the initial velocity, which is 10, and the mass, of course. So you can see that we can solve for the final velocity from that equation. So mv final should be equal to 10, and the minus mv1, you can put it on this side, plus mvi. The mass is 0 0.1 kilograms, as you see over there. The initial velocity was 10. So the, M, the final momentum is going to be the change in momentum given by the hockey stick plus the momentum that you already had, which was 0 0.1 times 10. That was what you had, what the puck had before the stick hit it. Okay, So that is 10 plus 1, that's 11. So now we know that the final momentum of the hockey puck is 11 kilogram meters per second. And knowing that the mass is 0 0.1, you just divide it by 0 0.1 to get your final velocity, right? So the hockey puck starts with 10 meters per second. The force is acting on the hockey puck. It gives it some impulse, which is the same as to say that it's going to change the momentum of the hockey puck. At the end, it ends up with 110 meters per second. Yeah. Another way to solve this problem will be doing what? <coughs> if you didn't know anything about impulse, what would you do if I give you that problem? You have a force acting on a mass. So what does that force produce? When a force is acting on a mass, you get an, an That's right. You get an acceleration. How much is the acceleration of the hockey puck? that the stick is giving it. So it's F, the force, divided by the mass. So that will be how many meters per second squared? 100, 10 divided by 0 0.1. That's 100 meters per second squared. That's the acceleration of the hockey puck while the stick is pushing it. Right? 100 meters per second squared. If an object has an acceleration of 100 meters per second squared over one second, by how much does the velocity change? 100 meters per second squared times 1 equals 100 meters per second. So the velocity should have changed by 100 meters per second. You started with 10. What's your final velocity? 110, right? All right. So obviously you can do it that way or you can do it this way. There's problems where this will be approach will be the preferred one. Okay? But in this one, it doesn't seem to make any difference. Yeah? Notice that uh, the equation that we really have is delta p equals the integral of the net force with respect to time, not just one force, right? So when you have an object that is acted upon by several forces, not just one, like in the hockey uh, and puck case, but maybe several of them acting at the same time, what you have is the integral of the sum of all of the forces acting on the object, right? You can invert the, exchange the, the uh, order of the summation and the integral. And what you have here is the momentum, is the impulse of the force F sub i. Right? i is an index that goes between 1 and the number of forces that you have acting on your system. If you have three forces, then from 1 to 3, right? So this, num this is the impulse of the force uh, F sub i. So you're adding the impulse of all of the forces acting on the system to get your total change in momentum of the system. Okay? So what this equation says basically is that you're adding the impulse of force 1 plus the impulse of force 2 and as many forces as you have in your problem. When you add those, all those impulses, you should end up with delta p. That should be the change in momentum of the system. Okay? So here's an example where you have two forces that are doing impulse that put in an impulse on an object. So the object that I have here is a ball. It fell. It's going to hit this uh, board. It's coming in with some initial velocity of 3 meters per second. And it's going to bounce off right after the collision. It's going to have some uh, vertical velocity right after it uh, loses contact with the board. So what's the uh, final velocity of that ball? The mass of the ball is here. And here's the information about the normal force that was acting on that ball while the ball was interacting with the board. Okay? While, the ball, war, uh, while the ball was touching the board and coming down, it was putting a force on it. 
So the board has to push back on the ball, otherwise the ball would have gone through the board. So the board had to put this much force, normal force on that ball, and the normal force, if we had some device measuring uh, time, recording the value of the force at a specific time, then let's say that it did something like this. It makes sense that it starts at zero, and then it grows, and then it goes back to zero, right? Because the ball is coming in, when it hasn't touched the board, the board hasn't, doesn't have to do anything, right? So that's zero. This is before the ball touched the board. Then at this point, let's say at t equals zero, is when the ball is touching the board. So just touching, right? Sometime later, what the ball is doing is moving uh, downwards, right? So the ball is probably getting squished, right? It's getting deformed, just like a spring getting compressed, right? So as the ball is getting compressed, the force between the ball and the board is climbing until the ball reaches a maximum compression. Right? Imagine a tennis ball getting compressed by the racket. Okay? When it, until it reaches maximum compression, that's your 230 newtons of force right there. Right? Then at that point the ball is stopped momentarily and now that spring starting to jump back. Right? So now the ball is starting to go like this, decompress. So the force now is pressing less hard on the board so the force is going down, and now the ball, when it just loses contact with the board, the force becomes zero. Yeah? So that whole interaction took 12 milliseconds in this problem. So how do we use that information to find what's going to be the final velocity of the ball when it leaves the board? So you look at the area, right, of that plot, because you're going to need that area because the area of that plot is going to be the impulse of the normal force. The impulse of the normal force is one of the forces that is going to change the momentum of the ball. Right? What's the other force? The other force that is acting while the ball is interacting with the board. That's right. So gravity is always going to be acting on this ball even when it's colliding with the board. So that would be another force there. And remember that this is the net force. Okay, the net force is going to be the net force is going to be the normal minus the weight of the ball while the ball is interacting. So that means that here the change in momentum is going to be due to the impulse due to the normal force plus the impulse due to the weight while the ball is interacting, right? So we're going to need the impulse of the normal force, as we said before, which is going to be the area of that thing. And we're going to need the impulse of the force of gravity. Okay? So let's start with the first one, the impulse of the normal. So that's that area. That's a triangle. So that's easy, right? It's going to be the base, the base of the triangle multiplied by the height in one half of that. So one half of the height. 230 newtons times the base. You gotta put that in seconds, right? So 0 0.012 seconds. And the direction. These things are vectors. Everything we're dealing with, force, momentum, impulse, they're all vectors. That means it matters whether it's going up or it's going down, right? So I'm gonna put a J hat here to indicate that it's up. This is the impulse of the normal force, which is pointing up. Okay? The impulse and the force go in the same direction. So that takes care of J sub n. We, all, we just need to put J of the gravity, the impulse of gravity. So what, how does gravity behave during that time of collision? The weight of the ball is going to be constant, right? The mass of the ball times G. That should be a constant. So the impulse of the force of gravity is simply going to be mg multiplied by 12 milliseconds. Is the area here, right? So I'm putting a minus sign for the impulse of gravity because gravity is a negative force. Okay, got to keep track of that. So that is minus the mass of the ball, 0.25 kilograms, g 9.8, and the amount of time, 0 0.012 seconds in the j direction. Okay, so just we just get those numbers. That's 1.35 newton seconds in the j direction. So we just calculated the change in momentum of the ball. 
That means the final momentum minus the initial momentum. Okay, so the next thing is to say that that is PF minus PI, right? So delta P is 1.35, we just calculated that, J hat, and that should be PF minus PI. That's MV final minus MV initial. That's the mass, 0.25 kilograms, multiplied by the difference in velocities as vectors, right? So 1.35 on the left-hand side divided by 0.25 kilograms should give you the difference in velocities. Now, what's the initial velocity? That was 3 meters per second downwards. That's your initial velocity, right? So what are we going to do? For the initial velocity, we're going to plug in minus 3 meters per second in the j direction. Okay? So what we have is Vf minus Vi, Vf minus minus 3. Right? So this number here gives you 5.4. And over here you have Vf. And the minus with the minus gives you the plus plus 3 meters per second. So finally, your final velocity is found to be 2.4 meters per second in the j direction. <coughs> so it is positive, which means, means that after the collision, the ball is moving up. Makes sense, right? So the ball had an in, uh, initial velocity of minus 3 meters per second downwards. After the collision, has a velocity of 2.4 going upwards. Notice that the impulse of the normal force that the impulse of the normal force is much bigger than the impulse of the weight of the ball. One was 1.38, the other one was 0 0.029, right? That came from the normal force going all the way up to 230 newtons during the collision, right? And the weight being just, um, how much was that? The mass was 0.25 times g, the weight was about 2.5. Newtons, right? The weight was 2.45 Newtons, and that was 230. So you can see that during the collision, the normal force is a lot bigger than the weight. And that is typical of a collision. This is what's always going to happen in a collision, is that the, the, the contact forces are going to be very large for a short amount of time, 12 milliseconds, right? So during that collision, you can neglect anything else that is not an impulsive force. The impulsive forces dominate in a collision and an explosion. So those are the ones that are really going to make a difference.